A sea of people is marching towards Mexico and America. The story began when they started boarding buses from the Honduras in the second week of October to find work, peace and a better life. They're running away from the crime, corruption and poverty of their homeland. U.S. President Donald Trump has called this act as, as uh, invasion and threatened to use military force against these immigrants. Fleeing poverty and violence, these migrants want to enter America. Forming human chains to cross a river at the border between Guatemala and Mexico. There are now three major groups moving north. The first group is of more than 300 people from Salvador. The second one consists mostly Hondurans, estimated to number between 3,500 and 7,000. They left their country in mid-October and are now in southern Mexico. And then there is a third group in this caravan that broke through a gate at the Guatemala border with Mexico and flashed with police. So far, more than 7,000 people have traveled with the caravan. UNICEF estimates at least 2,300 are children. They did not let me through. They said to wait in line. I'm going to wait. I know that God is great and he is going to help me. It's already been a while, like 20 days or a month maybe. I've already lost count, but God is great and I have run across many good people and they have helped me a lot. Her father works in the transport business. That's where he received a death threat. So we didn't have money to pay for a coyote, a smuggler who helps undocumented migrants reach the United States. So we opted to join the caravan. But this is what they will face once they reach the U.S. President Donald Trump's administration plans to send about 50 to 100 troops to the southern border with Mexico by the end of this week. President Donald Trump has threatened to close the U.S.-Mexico border and cut aid to Central America to try to stop the caravan of several thousand people. Some migrants have abandoned the journey, deterred by the hardships or the possibility instead of making a new life in Mexico. Caravans of migrants from Central America have made their way to the United States before also, but this is the largest in recent memory. Mexico has offered temporary identification papers and jobs to migrants who register for asylum in the country, stepping up efforts to halt the advance towards the U.S., which has angered Washington. We will report beyond World is One. The U.S. midterm polls due in November this year will decide the arithmetic of the U.S. Congress comprising the House of Representatives and the Senate. This year, nearly 100 Indian-American candidates have entered the race for federal, state and local offices. This is twice the number as compared to 2017. Beyond's diplomatic correspondent Sidhan Sibyl assesses the importance of the role played by the Indian community in the upcoming election. These calm streets of New Jersey are going to witness one of the most tightly contested midterm elections ever in the American history. And in these upcoming polls, Indian Americans are all set to play a key role. While several of them are running for elections, others will be exercising their franchise to shape up the new leadership. Nanak Nam Jahaz Gurudwara in New Jersey is busy these days with the preparations of the polls. This midterm since the current administration has taken a hard line, I would expect or I would assume uh, the word will be, especially the Indian community or the other communities, uh, 
will be going for the other way around. People are generally uh, up for, I mean, they're not for Trump, uh, is what the general, uh, I think, sense I get from people. So I would say people are going to vote for Democrats. Asa Singh Saroya came to New Jersey way back in 1985. He explains how the Indian community has grown over the years and is now making an impact in the American society. Saroya is even confident that U.S. will one day get an Indian-American as the president. Nikki Haley is working, but maybe somebody. Somebody coming. Somebody coming. Okay, now, uh, Mayor Ravinder Palla okay. is a our community, and uh, Garewal is a attorney of general. Okay. And, uh, large, large are coming now. Okay. Change is little bit. You going to change that? The community that eats together and prays together stays together. This Gurdwara is marking 10 years since it was built. And the focus today is how the Indian community can come together and be an important vote bank when it comes to the upcoming election. The Indian community makes sure that it meets together. There are strong linkages between the community and this Gurdwara is open for everyone for the entire Indian community and the South Asian community. They can come here anytime, pray. And of course, uh, the people here tell me that this Gurdwara played an important role during the recession time here in the United States of America way back in 2008. So clearly, the Indian community has come a long way when it comes to American politics and American society. Even the Americans feel that the Indian American community's role cannot be ignored. Very, very strong. Very strong. Um, the Indian community has always been a, a, a vital part to, to the large American society. There is a concerted effort, too, on furthering the cause of the Indian community. The Democrats seem to be the favorites among the Indians. I believe so far they are uh, leaning towards the Democratic Party. And um, that's where we are, and we support the Democratic Party. They're more liberal, and they're actually more towards the uh, minorities, whereas the Republicans, they're a little bit more on the opposite side, and we don't believe in their philosophy. The community also shared its views on the Kartarpur corridor issue between India and Pakistan. हमारा धर्म है हमारा वो स्थान है हमारे को क्यों नहीं जाने दिया जाएगा तो ये कुछ संस्था सी सी बना के कोई अच्छे से रूल एंड रेगुलेशन बना के उनको जाने देना चाहिए मैं तो खुद जाऊंगा द शेयर मील प्रोग्राम एट दिस न्यू जर्सी गुरुद्वारा इज प्रूविंग टू बी अ स्ट्रांग लिंक बिटवीन इंडिया एंड द रेस्ट ऑफ द अमेरिकन कम्युनिटी दिस पॉलिटिकल अवेकनिंग इन द इंडियन कम्युनिटी हियर इन यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स ऑफ अमेरिका the Indian community here is flexing its muscles, deciding the strategy and where to vote in the upcoming midterm polls here in the United States of America. Clearly, they understand their power and they can tilt the balance. With video journalist Mukesh Sankla, Sidhan Sibal for Vion in New Jersey. Indonesia has seen weeks of tragedy, the earthquake, the tsunami and now the plane crash. A day after the Indonesian Lion Air Flight 610 crashed into sea, minutes after takeoff from the capital city of Jakarta, investigators are still probing the reasons for the jet's sudden loss of altitude, which killed 189 passengers on board. Only 10 bodies have been recovered so far. As divers and rescue teams work to bring the remains of passengers and flights debris from the large expanse of the sea, the probe is focusing on the Boeing aircraft. Both the weather conditions uh, were optimum and the pilots had more than 6,000 flight hours of experience. So what exactly led to the crash of this plane? The aircraft's fuselage and flight data recorders are yet to be recovered, which may hold the clue to the final moments and provide more evidence as to what caused this crash about 13 minutes after takeoff. This flight was expected to land just uh, in just over an hour, the search and rescue operations have expanded to at least 400 square nautical miles and the Indonesian president, Joko Widodo, joined search teams at the port today where remains and debris recovered from the crash site have been unloaded. But authorities in the country say that it is unlikely that the remains of all the passengers on board this flight will be found. The Indonesian transport ministry, meanwhile, has ordered local airlines Lion Air and Garuda to inspect all their Boeing 737 MAX 8 airplanes.
It's one of the latest versions of the jet, which was first made in 1967. More than 10,000 737s have been produced since, uh, since then, making it the best-selling jetliner of all time. But safety records have been far from satisfactory, at least in the context of Indonesia. Violent st storms and heavy rains continue to batter Italy for the third straight day today. At least nine people have lost their lives. Several regions are on high alert and the city of Venice has been struck by some of the worst floods it has ever seen. It's called the floating city, but it's now hit by a deluge. Italy's lagoon city, Venice, is inundated. In fact, three quarters of the city is underwater. Tourists have been barred from the affected areas after the aqua altar or the high water crossed the five feet mark on Monday. It's something that has happened only five times in recorded history. St. Mark's Square is swamped. The military and police personnel were seen assisting people in the deep waters. The water crossed the raised walkways put out in flooded areas in Venice, forcing their removal. The water bus system has been stopped as well. Tourists have been barred from St. Mark's Square given the rise in water level. The threat is real. Several people have died in various parts of Italy as strong winds brought trees crashing down and rain swelling rivers to dangerous levels. Multiple weather warnings have been issued and orange alert, which is the second highest on the scale, has been issued for the central regions as well, including the capital Rome. Bureau report, we on World is One. Big relief for former Maldives President Mohamed Nasheed. The country's Supreme Court has stayed Mohammed Nasheed's jail sentence. He's been living in exile for years now. The Maldives Supreme Court has stayed the 13-year jail sentence on terrorism charges, allowing Mr. Nasheed to go back home this week. The Prosecutor General's Office has sought a review of Nasheed's conviction under the country's terrorism law. The move comes days before newly elected President Ibrahim Mohamed Soli is scheduled to take oath of office. Soli is a close ally of Nasheed. He has unseated former pro-China leader Abdullah Yamin in the election that took place on the 23rd of September by a 16.8% margin. Earlier, Vion spoke to Mohammed Nasheed, listening to what he had to say. This is his first reaction after the court order came. Um, the plan is, the intention is to um, go to go home day after tomorrow on the 1st of November. Um, and it's a huge satisfaction and a big relief that I'm able to go home and not be arrested as I land there. The Supreme Court has ruled that my sentence and my convictions should be suspended. So it is a very big satisfaction, relief. I will be able to now see my family, see friends, see colleagues. Um, I will be able to again work back at home. I think all, our, all of us must try to maintain uh, the government in, in government. Um, that would be um, our primary focus. Uh, and I will do whatever I can to make sure uh, that we maintain stable government and that power is always transferred through the ballot and nowhere else. And, and, and it, it always remains as such. So my work would be to see that the government is stable and also to see that we entrench democracy in the Maldives, to see that we consolidate democracy in the Maldives. Um, uh, and I think that's a handful of work to do. Yeah, it's, it's always been a matter of time. It was always a done deal. We always knew that the people of the Maldives were behind us. They did not want the dictatorship to be entrenched. They did not want authoritarian rule. They did not like any of the things that President Yamin were doing. So they voted for us overwhelmingly. And when that vote came out, there was very little that President Yamin actually could have done. And I didn't really quite believe uh, that President Yamin could do more after the results were announced. 